So thank you very much. Um, I hope I can give you today a short introduction in what automated speech translation is, how it works, like what are the basic technology there, and also challenges to see where it's performing very well, where it still has challenges, what may be the different challenges compared to human. Um, and I hope that you can give me some feedback later on Slido and have a lot of interesting questions. Um, so why are we doing uh, automated ma machine translation? So we are nowadays living in a globalized world where we can use technology to interact with a lot of people. We can travel in many countries if there's just no COVID uh, around. So we can go as tourists, we can meet people who speak different languages and we have the internet. So now you can listen to me and be somewhere over the world and listen to talks. Uh, people can watch movies and TV stations from over, all over the world. Nowadays, people follow lectures uh, no longer only at the university, but they go somewhere else and still uh, are able to listen there. So there's really great technology out there which enables communication between people from many uh, cultures. However, uh, there is still often the problem that there is a language barrier between the people. So the communication cannot be as good as it um, should be. Um, currently, there are mainly two solutions to that. In some situations, there are human interpreters which are able to bridge this gap and allow everybody to communicate. This is, for example, in the European Parliament, there is a, a great solution where every uh, member of the parliament can talk in his own language. So there is no barrier of entrance there and people cannot be members of parliament because they don't speak the language. However, this is not really possible in all situations. If you think of uh, universities, if you think of smaller meetings of smaller companies, it's there are just a too large amount of people needing interpretation services and often it's not uh, affordable. So what currently happens then in most of these cases is that people have to uh, use English and even speak English, although they are maybe not that well uh, speaking English. And it also ex excludes a lot of people because even in, in countries where, where English is, is teached in all uh, schools and so on, if you look how many people speak English, it's still for many not possible. So the question is, can we complement these solutions by having automated speech translation and thereby allow more people to join the discussion, to experience uh, the new technology, to uh, watch TV in, and inform themselves in other languages? Um, as you've seen, there's many different application scenarios and therefore it might be good to look a little bit on the properties like how these scenarios differs and this has a big influence how challenging this is for computers so how good is automated uh, translations and um, i listed here four possible um, difference between uh, these different scenarios so first of all it depends on how translation is used in a scenarios like the current one where i give a presentation and um, then people are listening to it, we would need simultaneous translation. So the, the translation needs to be in parallel to the person speaking. It would be not a really nice experience if I always would say one sentence and then I would wait for the translation and then I would say the next sentence. However, there are other situations where this is uh, quite convenient. If you more think of like a, a dialogue, for example, with a doctor, then normally what you need is a consecutive translation where you say one sentence and then there's an answer by one or two sentences and so on. And especially for machines, this might be significantly easier because we are speaking without having punctuation marks. We're not segmenting the sentences. So this is already a challenge for a computer that he needs to decide when there is a sentence boundary, how he can segment this into some reasonable parts. Then there is a big difference for computers between scenarios where there is a single speaker or where there are multiple speakers. Uh, in this single speaker scenario, often the speak, uh, speech is more fluent, while in an interactive scenario with several speakers, we have more hesitations, people interrupt each other, maybe they even speak at the same time. And while humans are very good at this so they can distinguish like who is speaking and still understand it for computers this is a real big challenge 
Thirdly, there is a difference between online and offline systems. If we translate a movie, for example, we have access to the full movie. We can use the context. We don't have to be fast. We can just use all our computational resources to present the best translation, which is uh, possible. In contrast, in situations where we have to do live uh, translations like here, if you would want to translate my presentation, then uh, you need an online system where the latency is important. So the time that passes between me speaking and the translation available to the audience. If you would only see the translations while I'm already speaking like three slides in the future, that's no longer helpful. And finally, one important difference is also the output modality. Especially in computers, we often see that people are using a text output, so we only see subtitles. And there are several reasons why this might even be preferred. On the other hand, in other scenarios, it might be better to have an audio output. So normally you can choose between them and we will also see in some demos like uh, the difference between them. As I already said, there is like a different, um, the, this uh, properties make some situations more challenging and others less challenging. So if we look back how this all involved, we'll see that people started, of course, with like the more easy scenarios. They are already in the, in 1991, we have seen a first speech translation system, which was able to translate in a very limited domain. So only for a very specific task, for example, for tourists, like so that they can ask for where to go, where the next restaurant is and things like that. And based on this, in the 90s, we have seen quite some research groups working on that. And we have seen first systems, which are like for a limited domain, for example, only for tourists or only for medicine, uh, which can do consecutive translations. So always translations of one or two sentences. Then in the beginning of the 2000s, we had more research proje projects on that. And for example, people worked on uh, developing systems which could be used in the European Parliament. So there it was about open domain. Of course, there's still quite some specific styles spoken, but in the European Parliament, you have talks about very different topics. And in this case, it's then consecutive, continuous. So we no longer have like fixed segments of, of one or two sentences, but we need to translate a full speech. Later in 2012, for example, uh, when I was at KIT, the group of Professor Weibel started the first simultaneous translation system for lectures. So in this case, we were then able to provide translations, in this case, from German to English for students, which would uh, quite some exchange students which aren't that well in German and are able to then follow the lecture um, in English. Then around 2015, we see the rise of deep learning. And this really boosted all the technology that was there. So with this technology, the, the performance of, of all the basic components we'll get to know really make a large jump and we see significantly better performance. And that also then led to more and more companies building real products. So nowadays we see that, for example, in um, uh, 2016, uh, Microsoft uh, published their own translator apps and with a more and more advances in, in how this works, we see now that it's uh, last year was integrated in PowerPoint. So we see more and more application of this technology also in the business. While there's still of course research going on and there we'll see that there are a lot of challenges still where research is needed to improve that. Um, so Let's have a look how this uh, works and what are the basic components um, we need to do is uh, automatic speech translation. And there are mainly three important components that we're using here. And where we can uh, build on a long time research where a lot of researchers have a lot put, put a significant amount of work into. So first of all, there's automatic speech recognition. There are tools that transcribe audio in one language into the same. So we have there the transformation from audio into text. And then there's uh, the machine translation, which more deals with text. So where we have technology that is able to translate from one source language into another target language. And again, uh, this is technology which has been developed for quite a while, but which is still under development and we still see really huge improvements here. 
And finally, there's text-to-speech, which does the inverse to the automatic speech recognition. So there we having text, and then we want to generate audio, which uh, gives the same content. And if you see these three um, components, uh, which are there, you directly can have an idea how we can do uh, automated speech translation. We can just build a cascade of all these systems. So we take first of all is our system. We take the audio and transcribe it in the same text. Then we can use our machine translation system, take the text in the source language and translate it into the target language. And finally, we can use our TTS um, and, and uh, output this um, as audio. And this is, although we'll see that this has several challenges and you can already see that if there's an error somewhere, of course, it will somehow propagate. This is still what is state of the art and was just used in many of the current uh, commercial systems. So this is really the, the core idea, which is still there. We are, will see that it's partly gets a little bit more complex, but that's the main idea you should keep in mind, like how uh, computers are doing automatic uh, speech translation. Since we are a little bit limited in, in time and the basic idea of many of these components are very similar. So for the next, I want to dive a little bit deeper how, how these components works. And I will do that on the example of machine translation. But the main concepts we will have a look at then are very similar than also applied in automatic speech recognition and partly also in TTS. So the, the basic ideas which are there followed are, all, are the same in, in these different uh, components. So let's have a look how we can do a machine translation. And then again, let's have a look again how that evolved over time. So the first approaches to machine translation, which are by now like quite old already, um, they started by what we're referring to as rule-based machine translation. The idea was there that uh, experts create, uh, manually create rules how we can do the translation. So we somehow program that can tell the system how it can translate. There has to be rules which describe how we can resolve ambiguities, which might be resolved in order to generate the correct translation. We, not, we have to define rules how we can translate the structure of a source sentence into the structure of the target sentence. However, language is really complicated. And is when people develop that, they, they notice that they need more and more rules to really build a system which cover like a real life situations. And at some point that just get, it went too complex. And uh, so nowadays you rarely see systems using that. Uh, what in contrast people are using is two different ways of corpus-based machine translation. In the beginning, people are using statistical machine translation. And then nowadays what nearly everybody has used, what we'll refer to as neural machine translation. And in all of these uh, approaches, the idea is that we use machine learning to learn how to translate from data. So we're no longer telling the computer directly how it should do the translation. In contrast, the idea is that we give him examples, we show him how humans translate, and then we enable him to automatically learn himself how he should best do the translation. In statistical machine translation, that was done by using more basic statistics, how often a word gets translated into another one. More in the neural machine translation, where we use what is nowadays the neural network, or which is referred to as deep learning, as one huge model which tries to learn the mapping from the source language to the target language. So in this corpus-based machine translation, the uh, basic uh, components are on the one hand the data and on the other hand the model. So we need on the one hand good data so that we can learn how to translate and on the other hand we need strong models that then are able to learn how to map the source language to the target language. So, so let's start with the data. What we typically need in machine translation is what we refer to as a parallel corpus. You can think of that uh, the same way as, as a Rosetta Stone. So in the Rosetta Stone, you have the same text written in three different languages. And that's what we also need for, for machine translation. We typically have one sentence in the source language, and then we have an alignment to the target language telling me this source sentence translates into this target language. And then we need really huge amounts of data. 
So typically nowadays we're spe speaking about million of sentences these systems are trained on. And that is really essential that we have much and good quality data. And the typical source, for example, is are the proceedings from the European Parliament. Then the second component is the model, the machine learning model. So this is something which should learn how you can map a source language sentence into a target language. So how you can um, um, yeah, do the translation process. And it should do that by looking at many examples and then inferring from them how we can do the mapping. So for simplicity, let's have a very simple example where we just have dots. So we want to map the left dots here to the right dots. And we have a correspondence. So you should map the orange dot to the orange dot and the gray dot to the gray dot and so on. So one model could be, for example, that you map the most left uh, point always to the most left point and so on. That's what's happening here in the example. And you see that this wouldn't be a good model because it doesn't map the uh, sentences which correspond correspond to each other. In contrast, if we would map uh, based on their height, so the lowest button uh, point to the lowest point and so on, we would have um, a better model which directly, at least for our training data, perfectly translates through sentences to target. Sense. And then are what are the models are. So these models are like ways we tell the system, these are possible ways how you can map. And now based on your training data, try to learn what a good mapping is. And there we already come to the first step. So these machine learning models, they now typically have two steps. So the one phrase is a training. That's the thing where we try to learn how to do the translation. And secondly, is a translation. In training, we are relying on our data. And that's why the data is so important. It is really the key of how, how this model learns. So just think about again of the Rosetta Stone, you take one language, which is your source language from there and put it to the model. So you're giving these this sentences to the model and then you let the model translate. What you then do is that you compare your translation with the one from the reference and then you try that the model with a very high probability gives a sentence which is most similar to that. So then you're changing the model, you're comparing your translation with a reference translation and try to change your model in a way that it now gives a high probability to the reference translation. And that's all the idea. We always try to maximize the probability of the training data. So we try to mimic what the humans have done. So can our model somehow mimic that how the, the human translates, it tries to do something similar. Once we have trained the model, so that's the first step, then normally the, the, the model is used and what is done, it's doing then, it's doing the translation. Translation looks in this way that the model searches for possible translations. Of course, we cannot generate all possible English sentences or German sentences here, but we are doing some intelligent search, generating several possible translations. And then these models gives a probability. It says like, based on what I've learned, I think this is a better translation. This is a not so good translation and so on. And then the idea is that over all sentences, we find a translation, which is the most probable. So we, we always are searching for translations which are as probable as possible. So this is the, the, the basic uh, concepts. Now I want to look a little bit more and at, at, at still at both steps, so at the data and at the model. So for the data, as, I, as you can hopefully now, now see, the performance of a model really heavily depends on the data and they are both on the quality and on the quantity. That on the one hand, of course, is a nice advantage. If we want to improve our model, we can try to collect more data and thereby improve it. If we want to translate a different language, we can just search for data for a different language. But still, there are quite some challenges. Of course, there are many languages where there's not enough data. And then we not only need some data, we need data with good quality. There's a big field of research, how we can find out which of the data is of good quality and which we can use to train our systems. And finally, where you see where these models, like although they have great performance, we are still there suffering is on data efficiency. So when we look how much data these models used to train, we see that even like eight years ago, they used already uh, in English, for example, 1.2 billion words. And we have 
nowadays we are having more and more data. So these models can really be trained on huge amounts of data. But of course, they're still often not as good as humans. And in contrast, humans, so there are some numbers that people are like roughly see 5 million words in their lifetime. So these systems nowadays have seen more words than any human has ever read, but they are often still not as good. So there the question is, how can we make these models more efficient? If we look at the model, I want to give you a, a short overview about what is currently the state of the art. And this is what we refer to as neural machine translation. And that's a model which consists of two parts. Here on the left side, the encoder, which is dealing on the source language, and then the decoder, which is dealing on the target language. The nice thing about that, this is one large artificial, uh, um, artificial neural network, which models the whole translation process. So we have one big model, which tries to do the full translation process. Thereby, we first have the encoder, which takes the word in the source language and learns a representation to them. Maybe it sounds a little bit awkward, but what it really does, it represents words as large vectors, so large numbers. But these have tried to uh, infer some meaning of the word. So it's, for example, they try that words which have a similar meaning are also somehow close to each other in, in these vector space. And then we have the decoder on the right side, which tries to generate one target word after the other. So we start with start telling him now start translating and then it's translating, it's generate the most probable first target word. Then we decide which one we take, we take the most probable one and then tell the system if this is the first word, what is then the most probable next word. And thereby the system always looks back at the, as an encoder and sees what is still missing, what do I need to translate to have a complete translation of this system. So here you see what is currently possible with, with, with neural machine translation. Now in the, in the last part of my presentation, I want to look a little bit into challenges where these uh, systems are still having problems and where they are like working very well. So the first challenge is due to this idea that we are just concatenating several components. So we were putting the ASR behind the MT and so on. And you can see, imagine that this leads to the problem if we having one, um, if one system does a mistake, the others, for the others, it's really hard to recover because they cannot look back on the original audio, they only see what the last system, for example, the ASR system produced. And if there are already errors, they cannot really recover from it. While humans normally are really good. So here's one example where we had an ASR system in German, which produced re Reben instead of Rede. You see these two words differ only by one letter. So it's a mistake which might the ASR system may do, but the English translation is really different. So that one means wines and the other means speeches. So if the human reads the ASR output, he might even like overread it because humans are good in like uh, ignoring these errors. However, if you see only the English translations, you're no longer really able to understand what was originally said. Therefore, there's currently a big trend into end-to-end -end approaches where we try to directly generate the target language sentence from the source audio. So where we try to collapse this cascade into one large model. A second large challenge, which uh, Will will talk more in the, in the second part, is the text processing. So in, while the MT system typically assumes really written, well-written text, this is not how people speak. First of all, we don't have uh, punctuation marks while speaking, but the computer has to infer um, what, what was the original uh, punctuation. And they, on the one hand, contain meaning. So at least for grandpa, it's a big difference if you see, say, let's eat grandpa or let's eat grandpa. And of course, they are also important for readability. So here you see on the left and the right, the same text, while the right has text has correct segmentation and punctuation marks, the left one is just segmented randomly. And you see that it's a lot harder to, to get the meaning and understand it uh, on the left side than on the right side. In addition, we are not speaking fluent. We have disfluencies in there. We're doing um, um, and hmm. We put in discourse markers, especially if we are in a more interactive scenario. We see something like, I mean, you know, and these 
you maybe want to remove sometimes if they're just a discourse marker, but of course you should not always remove, you know. We have re repetitions like I had, it had it had been a good day where we are like hesitating. We sometimes have to correct us. No, it cannot, I cannot go there where we correct ourselves. It's not it, it's I. So there we need some extra like power to be able to deal with, with this. And that's typically put between your ASR system and your machine translation system, where you have an extra text processor, which is trying to learn how to insert this information, how to clean the disfluencies. But as I said from this example, this is a challenge of its own because you cannot just delete things, you really have to rephrase them. And then one challenge, of course, is if we have to do simultaneous translation. So when we have to generate the uh, translations while speaking. Um, on the one end, computers also improve when they have more context. That's true for both for speech recognition and for machine translations. Therefore, in order to have the really best quality, what we want to do is to wait as long as possible so that we have all our information. On the other hand, for the user experience, it's really important to have a low latency. So you want to directly see what is said. And therefore you want to generate the translations as early as possible. And of course, this is especially challenging if we have languages with, with different word order. And that can be even like for, for me, like in German and English, the word order can be very different. Uh, we have sentences, if we have the German sentence, ich melde mich zur summer school an, this means I register myself to the summer school. However, only that it's registering and not withdraw my registration is only based on the last word. If that would not be an, but would be up, it would mean that we have to cancel our registration. So therefore, to really be able to translate it, we would have to know the full sentence before we can translate more than I. And human interpreters are very good at that. They, they know like how to, to rephrase things and maybe also to guess. But for computers, this is still a large challenge. And there is quite some research at the moment where we can make uh, like this latency as short as possible. Uh, in addition, we saw that we can learn from data. And that is really great because yeah, it's easy to um, um, to, 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 to learn more. Um, however, the problem is that there are many words which occur rarely or which emerge. So as I said, we first do the training, then apply it. If we don't change our model, we will not learn new words. And like five years ago, like the word Brexit occurs. And if the system was trained before, nobody would have been able to understand it. Or more recently, maybe you, there were some people talking about face masks, but it wasn't a really common term. Well, nowadays, everybody is talking about face masks and you should know how you translate that into different languages. And there are also rare words. So I, this example is, is from, from the system I've been working on where we saw the arrow that the translation was the binary payment system is. Of course, this doesn't make any sense. There is no binary payment system. And the problem was here that he mixed up two rare German words, which is either payment system or numeral system where like the German word only differs by like two letters in the, in the middle. So Zahlensystem or Zahlensystem, which is a big difference in the meaning, but the computer hasn't seen the word too often enough and there were mixed them up. Therefore people look into how they can like do something like lifelong learning or continue learning that they improve the system continuously and also integrate additional knowledge so that they can uh, learn specific terms. Uh, and finally, there's of course the question about context. So um, computers normally only see the current system in order to find the right translations, while humans can use a large bigger context to disambiguate the meaning of different words. And this can really lead to funny uh, like translations. And that's like many typical examples you see in the internet where machine translation fails and also speech translation is where there's not enough context. So we have seen that in lectures, like in a mass lecture, we, see, we saw the translation of the omen of a number. And uh, of course this does not, not make sense, but you, when you think back that this already what originally was said in German and people were talking about the Vorzeichen of the number, which means the sign. So the sign definitely makes number. What we just, the MT system didn't do the right disambiguation because it didn't have the domain knowledge that yeah, if you are in a mass lecture, it's just a lot more probable that you use the sign. 
And then sometimes you even need word knowledge or knowledge or, or outside so that you can do uh, the right disambiguation. If like an English moderator introduces uh, somebody with, I'm happy to introduce one of the best tennis players in the world, of course, uh, you need to know if, if you translate into German or other languages, if this player is female or, or male, because these are just different words in German. And if you don't do that correctly, then um, the, the system will never be able to that. And currently MT systems are really focusing on the text only, so they will not be able to do that. So to summarize, I hope I've given you some idea about what machine translate, what automatic speech translation is, about how uh, machine learning is used there, how we can use more data to improve them. I hopefully have shown you that there are several situations where this really can already help, uh, especially in situations where there's no human interpreter, but there are of course still many open challenges. And uh, about how there's uh, the question also about when to use it and how to use it and maybe how to combine. So thanks for listening. I hope you have later some questions which we'll be able to uh, answer after Will's talk. And if you want to learn more about machine translation, there's now also a free course on Coursera. And thereby I hope uh, to see now Will.